W. Full text of four cardinals letter to Pope Francis with explanatory notes and five questions. Second part. The questions. Doubt number one. It is asked whether, following the affirmations of Amoris Laetitia, N. N. 300-305, it has now become possible to grant absolution in the sacrament of penance and thus to admit to Holy Communion a person who, while bound by a valid marital bond, lives together with a different person more uxorio, in a marital way without fulfilling the conditions provided for by Familiaris Consortio N84 and subsequently reaffirmed by Reconciliatio at Penitentia N34 and Sacramentum Caritatis N29. Can the expression in certain cases found in Note 351, N305, of the exhortation of Morris Letitia be applied to divorced persons who are in a new union and who continue to live more uxorio? Question 1 makes particular reference to a Morris Letitia and 305 and 2 footnote 351. While note 351 specifically speaks of the sacraments of penance and communion, it does not mention the divorced and civilly remarried in this context, nor does the main text. Pope John Paul II's Apostolic Exhortation Familiaris Consortio, N84, already contemplated the possibility of admitting the divorced and civilly remarried to the sacraments. It mentions three conditions. The persons concerned cannot separate without committing new injustices for instance, they may be responsible for the upbringing of their children. They take upon themselves the commitment to live according to the truth of their situation, that is, to cease living together as if they were husband and wife, more uxorio, abstaining from those acts that are proper to spouses. They avoid giving scandal, that is, they avoid giving the appearance of sin so as to avoid the danger of leading others into sin. The conditions mentioned by Familiaris Consortio N84 and by the subsequent documents recalled will immediately appear reasonable once we remember that the marital union is not just based on mutual affection and that sexual acts are not just. One activity among others that couples engage in. Sexual relations are for marital love. They are something so important, so good and so precious, that they require a particular context, the context of marital love. Hence, not only the divorced living in a new union need to abstain, but also everyone who is not married. For the church, the sixth commandment do not commit adultery has always covered any exercise of human sexuality that is not marital, that is, any kind of sexual acts other than those engaged in with one's rightful spouse. It would seem that admitting to communion those of the faithful who are separated or divorced from their rightful spouse and who have entered a new union in which they live with someone else as if they were husband and wife would mean for the church to teach by her practice one of the following affirmations about marriage, human sexuality, and the nature of the sacraments. A divorce does not dissolve the marriage bond and the partners to the new union are not married. However, people who are not married can under certain circumstances legitimately engage in acts of sexual intimacy. A divorce dissolves the marriage bond. People who are not married cannot legitimately engage in sexual acts. The divorced and remarried are legitimate spouses and their sexual acts are lawful marital acts. A divorce does not dissolve the marriage bond, and the partners to the new union are not married. People who are not married cannot legitimately engage in sexual acts, so that the divorced and civilly remarried live in a situation of habitual, public, 
objective and grave sin. However, admitting persons to the Eucharist does not mean for the Church to approve their public state of life. The faithful can approach the Eucharistic table even with consciousness of grave sin, and receiving absolution in the sacrament of penance does not always require the purpose of amending one's life. The sacraments, therefore, are detached from life. Christian rites and worship are in a completely different sphere than the Christian moral life. Doubt number two. After the publication of the post synodal exhortation Amoris Laetitia, CFN 304, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of St. John Paul Lyai's encyclical Veritatis Splendor N79, based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the Church, on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts and that are binding without exceptions? The second question regards the existence of so-called intrinsically evil acts. John Paul Lyai's encyclical Veritatis Splendor 79 claims that one can qualify as morally evil according to its species. The deliberate choice of certain kinds of behavior or specific acts, apart from a consideration of the intention for which the choice is made or the totality of the foreseeable consequences of that act for all persons concerned. Thus, the encyclical teaches that there are acts that are always evil, which are forbidden by moral norms that bind without exception, moral absolutes. These moral absolutes are always negative, that is, they tell us what we should not do, do not kill, do not commit adultery, only negative norms can bind without exception. According to Veritatis Splendor, with intrinsically evil acts no discernment of circumstances or intentions is necessary. Uniting oneself to a woman who is married to another is and remains an act of adultery that is such as never to be done, even if by doing so an agent could possibly extract precious secrets from a villain's wife so as to save the kingdom. What sounds like an example from a James Bond movie has already been contemplated by St. Thomas Aquinas, de Mallo, Q15, a1. John Paul II argues that the intention, say, saving the kingdom, does not change the species of the act, here, committing adultery, and that it is enough to know the species of the act, adultery to know that one must not do it. Doubt number three. After Amoris Laetitia, N301. Is it still possible to affirm that a person who habitually lives in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, as for instance the one that prohibits adultery, cf. MT 19, 3-9, finds him or herself in an objective situation of grave habitual sin, cf. Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts, Declaration, June 24, 2000, in paragraph 301 Amoris Laetitia recalls that the Church possesses a solid body of reflection concerning mitigating factors and situations, and it concludes that hence it can no longer simply be said that all those in any irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin and are deprived of sanctifying grace. In its declaration of June 24, 2000, the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts seeks to clarify Canon 915 of the Code of Canon Law, which states that those who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. The Pontifical Council's declaration argues that this canon is applicable also to faithful who are divorced and civilly remarried. It spells out that grave sin has to be understood objectively, 
given that the minister of the Eucharist has no means of judging another person's subjective imputability. Thus, for the declaration, the question of the admission to the sacraments is about judging a person's objective life situation and not about judging that this person is in a state of mortal sin. Indeed subjectively he or she may not be fully imputable or not be imputable at all. Along the same lines, in his encyclical Ecclesia de Eucharistia, N37, St. John Paul II recalls that the judgment of one state of grace obviously belongs only to the person involved, since it is a question of examining one's conscience, hence, the distinction referred to by Amoris Laetitia between the subjective situation of mortal sin and the objective situation of grave sin is indeed well established in the Church's teaching. John Paul II, however, continues by insisting that in cases of outward conduct which is seriously, clearly and steadfastly contrary to the moral norm, the Church, in her pastoral concern for the good order of the community and out of respect for the sacrament, cannot fail to feel directly involved. He then reiterates the teaching of Canon 915 mentioned above. Question 3 of the Dubians would like to clarify whether, even after Amoris Laetitia, it is still possible to say that persons who habitually live in contradiction to a commandment of God's law, such as the commandment against adultery, theft, murder, or perjury, live in objective situations of grave habitual sin, even if, for whatever reasons, it is not certain that they are subjectively imputable for their habitual transgressions. Doubt number 4. After the affirmations of Amoris Laetitia, N302, on circumstances which mitigate moral responsibility, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of St. John Paul I's encyclical Veritative Splendor N81? Based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the Church, according to which circumstances or intentions can never transform an act intrinsically evil by virtue of its object into an act subjectively good or defensible as a choice? In paragraph 302, Amoris Laetitia stresses that on account of mitigating circumstances a negative judgment about an objective situation does not imply a judgment about the imputability or culpability of the person involved, the dubia point to the churches. Teaching as expressed in John Paul I's Veritative Splendor according to which circumstances or good intentions can never turn an intrinsically evil act into one that is excusable or even good. The question arises whether Amoris Laetitia, too, is agreed that any act that transgresses against God's commandments, such as adultery, murder, theft, or perjury, can never, on account of circumstances that mitigate personal responsibility, become excusable or even good. Do these acts, which the Church's tradition has called bad in themselves and grave sins, continue to be destructive and harmful for anyone committing them in whatever subjective state of moral responsibility he may be, or could these acts, Depending on a person's subjective state and depending on the circumstances and intentions, cease to be injurious and become commendable or at least excusable? Doubt number 5. After Amoris Laetitia, N303, does one still need to regard as valid the teaching of St. John Paul II's encyclical Veritative Splendor N56? based on sacred scripture and on the tradition of the church.
that excludes a creative interpretation of the role of conscience and that emphasizes that conscience can never be authorized to legitimate exceptions to absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsically evil acts by virtue of their object. Amoris Laetitia and 303 states that conscience can do more than recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demands of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty what for now is the most generous response which can be given to God. The dubia ask for a clarification of these affirmations given that they are susceptible to divergent interpretations. For those proposing the creative idea of conscience, the precepts of God's law and the norm of the individual conscience can be in tension or even in opposition. While the final word should always go to conscience that ultimately decides about good and evil. According to Veritative Splendor and 56, on this basis, an attempt is made to legitimize so-called pastoral solutions contrary to the teaching of the magisterium, and to justify a creative hermeneutic according to which the moral conscience is in no way obliged, in every case, by a particular negative precept. In this perspective, it will never be enough for moral conscience to know this is adultery, or this is murder. In order to know that this is something one cannot and must not do, rather, one would also need to look at the circumstances or the intentions to know if this act could not, after all be excusable or even obligatory, cf question 4 of the dubia. For these theories, conscience could indeed rightfully decide that in a given case, God's will for me consists in an act by which I transgress one of his commandments. Do not commit adultery is seen as just a general norm. In the here and now, and given my good intentions, committing adultery is what God really requires of me. Under these terms, cases of virtuous adultery, lawful murder and obligatory perjury are at least conceivable. This would mean to conceive of conscience as a faculty for autonomously deciding about good and evil and to conceive of God's law as a burden that is arbitrarily imposed and that could at times be opposed to our true happiness. However, conscience does not decide about good and evil. The whole idea of a decision of conscience is misleading. The proper act of conscience is to judge and not to decide. It says, this is good, this is bad. This goodness or badness does not depend on it. It acknowledges and recognizes the goodness or badness of an action, and for doing so, that is, for judging, conscience needs criteria, it is inherently dependent on truth. God's commandments are a most welcome help for conscience to get to know the truth and hence to judge verily. God's commandments are the expression of the truth about our good, about our very being, disclosing something crucial about how to live life well. Pope Francis, too, expresses himself in these terms when in Amoris Laetitia 295, the law is itself a gift of God which points out the way, a gift for everyone without exception.